So the learning objectives are to review the echocardiographic diagnostic criteria for bioprosthetic valve thrombosis, and then review and hopefully dispel some of the misconceptions associated with uh, bioprosthetic valve uh, thrombosis. So I'll start off with the case. Uh, I feel a little uh, self-conscious about all these hyphens here, but I'm pretty sure these are correct, you know. I was a 77-year-old uh, man who had a surgical aortic valve uh, replacement about three years ago. He was feeling great, uh, coming back to the valve clinic for routine uh, follow-up, which is something that we do at Mayo, even though the guidelines will say after you put a tissue valve in someone, they don't have to come back until five years you know, after the implantation. But we like to keep uh, closer surveillance uh, on this, on this patient. So the patient's come back for routine follow-up in the valve clinic. And his clinical examination really shows no evidence of heart failure. He's got distant heart sounds. There's a faint systolic murmur over the aortic valve consistent with his uh, prosthesis. So the background is blue here just because the echo images uh, show up uh, better. So this is a color compare view, zoomed up view of the person on a long axis of the aortic valve prosthesis. You can see here um, uh, the aortic valve prosthesis just in 2D and then color uh, across the aortic valve. And I forgot to say I have a couple of questions here for you guys, so get ready to, to, answer, uh, to answer these. So I'll let this play for a little bit, let you look at it. Okay, and so this is the short axis of the valve, um, zoomed up view, the aortic valve prosthesis, you can see the struts, and then color flow across the aortic valve. Um, so what is your assessment um, and plan uh, for this patient? So number one, this is a normal valve, repeat clinical exam and echo in one year. Um, this is a normal valve, repeat clinical exam in one year. Abnormal valve, get a TEE, trans uh, esophageal echo. Or you think this is an abnormal valve, get a, um, a 4D um, CT scan, cardiac CT. That is a very good question, and I will give you that next. <laughs> All right. Very astute, because you always need more data, right? So again, you know, person on a long uh, axis view here. And then, so if I tell you that the mean gradient uh, right now during the psychocardiogram is 34 millimeters of mercury, and the baseline mean gradient following aortic valve prosthesis placement was 16, Millimeters of mercury in the peak velocity is four meters per second, up from a baseline of 2.5 uh, meters per second. Um, how would you vote uh, now? And I think most of you probably voted uh, correct on this thing to begin with. So let me see. All right, so abnormal valve, get a TEE. So a little bit more uh, uptake when we added the Doppler uh, hemodynamics on top of the uh, visual inspection of the valve. So, you know, part of the evaluation of this prosthesis is that you really um, should get clued in on some of the visual clues of uh, bioprosthesis uh, dysfunction. Uh, either thrombosis or degeneration. So if you pay close attention here, you can see that the anterior cusp of this uh, tissue prosthesis is not moving as well as the posterior cusp. And then if you see flow across the aortic valve and the anterior part of it, it seems to be a low uh, velocity flow. And then the um, posterior part of it, it seems to be where most of the flow is going through. So high velocity uh, flow area. And you can see the same thing in the short axis, the sort of immobility or reduced mobility of the anterior cusp of the aortic valve prosthesis and then differential flow across the aortic valve uh, prosthesis. Now the next step that we did, you could get a transesophageal echocardiogram, which is you know, what we do routinely in some of these patients. But we've uh, you know, pivoted to cardiac CT because cardiac CT I think has um, a really good uh, look at the aortic valve uh, when you're looking at mitral prosthesis or tricuspid prosthesis, I think a transesophageal echo uh, is good uh, for that. But for the aortic valve prosthesis, we've really pivoted to using the um, uh, cardiac CT. 
And what you see in acadic CT is a sort of what's been described as a hypo attenuating uh, leaflet thickening or hypo attenuating uh, lesions on the aortic valve cusps. And it's usually at the base uh, of the cusps uh, where you see this sort of darkening, thickening, and darkening of the cusps uh, consistent with a layer of uh, thrombus. And you can see here restricted leaflet mobility uh, as well. And so the patient was uh, diagnosed with uh, bioprosthetic valve thrombosis. And it was completely asymptomatic, uh, but we saw a change in his hemodynamics across the, uh, across the aortic valve. So what are some of the misconceptions in uh, bioprosthetic valve thrombosis? One of them is that it is uncommon, and it turns out that it's actually uh, more common uh, than we think it is. Now, some of this uh, began with the portico valve. I think part of the portico valve, transcatheter heart valve that Kevin mentioned, the protocol included getting cardiac CTs in some of those patients. And they started noticing that uh, there was this leaflet uh, thrombosis in some of these patients. And so uh, people started looking back at the transcatheter heart valves and some of the surgical valves looking for this uh, problem of these uh, lesions uh, uh, on these valves. And the initial data from um, you know, registries and some of the uh, initial uh, data from the transcatheter heart valve showed a maybe incidence of about 14%, 12 to 14% of bioprosthesis valve thrombosis, so at least these uh, hypoattenuating uh, leaflet uh, thickening and restricted leaflet, leaflet motion on this valve is about uh, 12 to 14%. Uh, uh, percent. And they also found that it was more common in the TAVA valves and less common in the uh, surgical valve. So one of the misconceptions is that it's unusual in surgical uh, prosthesis and more common in the uh, TAVA valve. But then they started looking sort of head-to-head -head comparison in some of the sub-studies of the uh, TAVA uh, versus SAVA uh, valves in the uh, balloon expandable valve as well as the uh, self-expanding valve. So there were uh, sub-studies uh, where some of the patients who were enrolled in these trials had cardiac CTs to look at uh, the incidence of, uh, of valve uh, thrombosis. And it was actually pretty high, uh, both at uh, three months as well as uh, one year. Uh, high incidence of valve thrombosis, about 28% in the surgical valves and 31% in the uh, uh, TAVA valves in the Evolute uh, low risk uh, substudy. 20% in the SEVA valves and about 28% in the Partner 3 low risk uh, trial. Now, the other misconception is that this only occurs uh, during the first year. Um, uh, while it's true that if your bioprosthesis were to fail in the first year, the most common mechanism of that failure is bioprosthetic valve uh, thrombosis. So this is data from Mayo looking at all the explanted valves, all the valves that failed and that were explanted. Uh, looking at the mechanism of failure of those valves. And this is our early experience where we really didn't have, you know, weren't clued in really into this entity of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis. And it turned out that about 10% of the valves that we took out for failure uh, were because of bioprosthetic valve uh, thrombosis. And so when you look at the uh, incidence of that over time after the valve was put in, yes, bioprosthesis uh, thrombosis happens earlier than degeneration of the valve, pan panis formation or leaflet uh, uh, degeneration. But the majority of the patients that had uh, bioprosthetic leaflet valve thrombosis, that occurred actually um, more than a year after the valve was put in. So about 65% of them, the valve thrombosis occurred uh, after a year. Now, if you go back and you look at sort of the entire um, uh, ECHO uh, database and all those patients that we um, uh, um, have under surveillance, um, if you look at uh, a prosthetic valve uh, dysfunction and try to figure out, okay, if the mechanism is bioprosthetic valve thrombosis versus structural uh, failure, looking at the first year, second year, third year, fourth year after the valve uh, was put in. When you compare those two mechanisms, the majority of the patients, again here, 28% of those valves that failed in the first year were due to bioprosthetic valve thrombosis and none due to structural failure. And uh, second year after the valve was put in, it's still bioprosthetic valve thrombosis, third year and fourth year and so forth. 
the, the farther away you get from the valve implantation, the, the higher the incidence of structural failure compared to bioprosthetic valve uh, thrombosis. But really, it can occur two, three, four, uh, five, six years after your, your bioprosthetic, bioprosthetic valve has been put in. The other misconception is that uh, this is an easy uh, diagnosis uh, to make, uh, but actually it's not. <clears throat> when we looked at our uh, data, you know, the patients that had uh, um, uh, bioprosthetic valve thrombosis, they had abnormal findings described in the, um, in the echo reports, but uh, the diagnosis of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis really was not suspected in more than 95% of the patients. So yes, there was something wrong with the valve, but we weren't saying that this was a bioprosthetic valve uh, uh, thrombosis. Too much emphasis on the Doppler uh, indices. We're saying, yes, it's dysfunctional, the gradient is high, uh, but really not paying attention uh, to uh, decide exactly what the mechanism of, bio, uh, of the um, dysfunction uh, was. So Dr. Pizlaru and colleagues came up with uh, this diagnostic criteria of how to make a diagnosis of bioprosthetic valve uh, thrombosis. So if you see an increased gradient over 50% um, over baseline within the first five years post-implantation, couple that with thickened non-calcified uh, leaflets and um, a restricted motion of the uh, uh, leaflets, then the patient most likely has bioprosthetic valve uh, thrombosis. And if you added all three parameters, had a pretty good sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing uh, bioprosthetic valve uh, thrombosis. So increased gradients about 50%, thickened non-calcified leaflets, restricted uh, leaflet motion. Now this is an example on the left of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis and on the right of degeneration. Notice on the right side, this bright, you know, um, uh, calcified, uh, limited uh, motion of the prosthesis. And on the left-hand side, in a patient with bioprosthetic valve thrombosis, the more pliability, less bright, less calcified um, uh, uh, bioprosthesis. So on the left, think bioprosthetic valve thrombosis, on the right, uh, degeneration. Now, you know, we've seen some patients that show up within, you know, six months after the valve was put in. And, uh, and um, you, know, you shouldn't hang your head necessarily on that this is bioprosthetic valve thrombosis because we've seen some very early degeneration of bioprosthetic valves for some reason in, in, in some of these patients. But the most likely diagnosis would be that um, it's leaflet thrombosis if it occurs uh, early. And then if you suspect it, uh, confirm with a transesophageal echo or with a cardiac CT. Again, if it's the mitral valve or the tricuspid valve, uh, go for the TE. If it's the aortic valve, uh, we think CT is a better imaging uh, modality. And then you always have to rule out um, infective endocarditis. Some of these patients have presented with asymptomatic uh, endocarditis, just thickening of the leaflets. The gradient is going up, and you drop blood cultures, and someone has endocarditis. Okay, so anytime uh, you're faced with this uh, situation, rule out uh, endocarditis with a set of, uh, of blood cultures. The other misconception is that um, you know oral anticoagulants quickly restore uh, function in these patients. We know that when you give them vitamin K antagonists, uh, it does uh, help. Um, and in the beginning, we were recommending anticoagulation for about six to eight weeks and then have the patient come back and see, you know, what, what happened to, to the gradients. So we did a study here looking at just the responders, uh, people that did respond to vitamin K antagonists, um, and looked at how long it took um, to respond and how long it took to restore normal functioning of the uh, bioprosthetic valve based on the position and type of the uh, bioprosthesis. And it turned out that uh, the mitral valve is the one most uh, responsive, and then less so the aortic valve and tricuspid valve uh, prosthesis. And we're actually surprised that in some of these patients, more than 50% of them, it took about uh, more than three months to fully restore uh, bioprosthetic valve uh, uh, function. Uh, so instead of, you know, a month or a month and a half, uh, some of these patients we think now need to be on three months of anticoagulation um, before you bring them back and, uh, and re-image uh, re the valve. 
Uh, the other misconception is that it's benign. You know, you put someone in anticoagulation, uh, the thrombosis goes away, you restore normal valve function. You know, do you take them off or do you keep them on uh, the uh, anticoagulant? Because some of these patients, you know, the choice for the bioprosthetic valve is to avoid anticoagulation. And this actually has become um, a point of discussion with some of the patients where you say, well, you know, initially we'll put you on anticoagulation for three months following bioprosthetic valve implantation because this is what the guidelines recommend, but you may develop a need for anticoagulation based on this uh, phenomenon. Yes, patients do develop need for anticoagulation based on other things like atrial fibrillation and stuff that they develop after uh, putting a valve in, but this is something that we uh, uh, caution. So if you look at this small uh, subset of patients, about 62 uh, of them that did respond to uh, um, uh, anticoagulation, we restored a normal bioprosthetic valve uh, function. So over time, what happens uh, to these patients? And if we compare them to control that did not have a bioprosthetic valve thrombosis, we found, in fact, that these patients are at high risk of re-thrombosing. So we used to put them on anticoagulation and then take them off anticoagulation. So not only are they at risk of re-thrombosing the valve, but they're also at risk of needing a valve replacement down the road compared to other patients that did not have bioprosthetic valve thrombosis. Um, okay, so this is not a benign uh, condition. Okay, so take home points uh, on this, uh, that it is uh, common by prosthetic valve thrombosis or leaflet thrombosis after tissue valve implantation is common. It happens in both uh, surgical valves as well as transcatheter valves. It can occur late, so if you see someone with a dysfunctional valve a year, two, three years after you put it in, think about this condition because it still could be that, and you can give them anticoagulation instead of sending them to surgery for explantation of that valve. Um, it is uh, challenge, challenging to make the diagnosis, uh, but think about uh, these criteria. Uh, gradient, more than 50% over baseline, restricted cusp mobility, thickened leaflets that are not calcified. Uh, think about uh, bioprosthetic leaflet thrombosis. And then uh, cardiac CT for aortic valve um, um, prosthesis, further evaluation of aortic valve prosthesis, and then transesophageal echocardiogram for the uh, other ones. And then make sure you rule out uh, endocarditis. Just get a set of blood cultures, especially for patients with uh, a tab of valves in the elderly. There seems to be a higher incidence of endocarditis in those patients than than would be what was normally uh, seen. Uh, it can occur while the patient is on anticoagulation. We're not really sure the best. We think vitamin K antagonists probably are better than DOAX uh, for this uh, condition, but it can occur while the patient is on anticoagulation. And then it takes time to decrease the gradients. Again, initially it was four to six weeks, uh, but we think now maybe three months. It's not a benign condition, and then there's some unknowns. You know, does anticoagulation for three months after you put a bioprosthesis in, does that prevent future episodes of, uh, of, um, of uh, bioprosthetic valve thrombosis or not? Uh, it's unknown. Um, and we're getting a hint that the uh, longevity of the valve is affected by, by this incidence of uh, uh, bioprosthetic valve thrombosis, and with that, I will close and uh, thank you.